Great. Well, I'll just get started with my intro and I have a couple more folks come in. Um, but hi, everyone, and welcome for um, to our webinar today. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Emily Breaker, and I am the Education and Training Officer for Arctos, and I am joined by Michelle Ku, who is the Staff Curator of um, Biodiversity, Informatics, and GIS at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley. And uh, she'll be presenting today's topic on archives in Arctos. And uh, MVZ has extensive archives from field notes to historic photos and correspondences and annotated maps. And um, I did a little poking around on your website and saw that you all received a couple of pretty big grants in the mid 2010s to help digitize those and, and get some material online. And now MVZ is kind of in the process of migrating out of Archivist Toolkit, which is a deprecated software, and into Arctos. And uh, currently in Arctos, there's kind of a lot of collections that have archival material here and there that are linked with records, but uh, MVZ's archives will be really the first official archive collection using Arctos. Um, and Michelle has really been integral to kind of um, thinking about pipelines and strategies to accommodate archive metadata and finding aids and uh, making that material discoverable. So I know a lot of us curate archival materials and are really excited to learn uh, what MBZ has done. So um, I'm just going to do a couple of announcements before I turn everything over. So I see a lot of folks that might be new to Arctos. So for those of you, um, here's some resources that you can feel free to check out. So the first is our website, arctosdb.org, and that's where you can go to find more, um, learn more about Arctos and how to join. And from there, you'll be able to access all the other links. So including our, um, our database portal at arctos.database.museum, our user manual. So all of our handbooks are online and there's lots of great tutorials in there. Um, and then a link to our webinar recordings. So um, we have a YouTube channel where you can see all of our previous webinars. And then the next thing I'll announce is our webinar that will be happening uh, election day next month, November 8th. Um, same time, it's on Arctos Entities, which is something that we've been using to link catalog records together. So Teresa Mayfield Mayer will be presenting that topic and we'll have some guest collection managers who will showcase some specific use cases from their collections. So hopefully you can join us and um, just keep an eye out for the announcement. And then, um, yeah, feel free to use the chat to ask your questions during the webinar and we'll have plenty of time to, uh, to discuss questions and, um, and out loud with Michelle. So I'll turn it over to you, Michelle. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, let's see if I can swap over. I've got a very short presentation. I'm just gonna say that um, uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, I'm, I'm gonna say that this is very much a work in progress. So uh, don't, um, you know, has, so, uh, Whatever I say now, I'll have the caveat that we may make adjustments and as we go forward. Anyway, so this is a, a, a quick introduction. Uh, I don't need to uh, uh, belabor the um, importance of archives, but, you know, really in my way of thinking, you know, archives uh, is the result of field work. It, I mean, that's primarily uh, the focus of our archives here at the museum. It's been part of our um, thinking from the very beginning and uh, when we were established in 1907 with Joseph Grinnell. So, um, and not only that archives, so some parts of, of archival activity, like the fieldwork part, really hasn't changed for a hundred years or two more than that. Um, but, you know, obviously the media changes and um, those are all challenges that uh, we're facing um, right now. So I'm also happy to just talk about archive management in general. So this is just a quick snapshot of, uh, uh, of the archives that we're dealing with here, just to give you a little bit of scope on what we're dealing with. So we've got over a thousand bound field notes, um, but we have, um, it's, the number is probably closer to probably 500 unbound field notes because I have a lot of 
stuff sitting actually all over my office <laughs> in boxes um, waiting for processing. Uh, we have manuscript collections, um, maps, lots of historic images, uh, um, and uh, uh, several thousand uh, folders of correspondence, as well as lots of uh, nowadays born digital content, you know, like uh, photos that come straight out of your digital cameras. So, um, so it's a lot of stuff. Um, and we're just kind of dealing with it a little by little, but the main emphasis has been on our field notes. So I'm going to kind of more or less uh, use as our um, as a, as the use case. But before I get started, I just wanted to explain a little bit of um, the background work we did. Um, so even before the pandemic, I started this project of um, trying to figure out how we're going to take care of our um, archives and the database. Um, especially since our current archival uh, uh, database uh, was being deprecated in favor of one that, um, you know, wasn't actually meeting um, our functional requirements. So I'm just going to walk you through some of my thinking. Um, I actually have a lot more gory details that I won't dwell into. But, you know, when you look, compare the functional requirements of natural history museums and archives, there's a lot of things that are very, very similar. So, for instance, you can see here um, the things we care about, the informational objects that uh, we have to manage in a natural history museum, you know, are very similar to what we have to deal with in archives, um, with the exception, of course, of the very first bullet point, which are the actual objects that we're curating. So for a natural history museum, generally biological specimens, could be geological specimens, but some specimen object of some kind. And the objects, the physical objects that we're dealing with in archives, um, just vary uh, because they're actually a lot more diverse and usually they all come along with a biological specimen. So usually when you're handed, where I'm, you know, you're handed a bunch of um, critters to, to catalog into Arctos in a natural history museum, you're also given lots of journals and catalogs and maybe photos and other, you know, maybe a spreadsheet of data, um, maybe GIS work, you know, a bunch of other things. Um, but the archives here, at least, we also take care of, um, uh, maybe historic field equipment, artwork, um, slides in a lot of different, I mean, rather images in a lot of different um, uh, uh, formats. So the diversity can be huge. Um, but everything else is kind of the same. So people, we care about people, we want to know who collected it, who were the curators, who touched it, who, you know, had anything to do with this particular object, um, you know, information about those people, contact information, so addresses, emails, taxa. Uh, there's a taxonomy for both uh, in natural history museums and archives. Um, locality information, dates. Um, collecting is just one of the many dates that are associated with uh, that we have to manage. Um, publication, citation, references, those are all pretty much the same. And, um, and then, of course, more or less, I think of kind of the like, bureaucratic uh, documents, you know, ownership, deed of gifts in the case of archives, maybe permitting in case of natural history museums, but essentially the legal documentation. Um, in terms of the collection management functions, um, there's still a process of acquisition. So in archives, they also call it uh, accessions. Uh, we, in both um, uh, institutions, you're going to have a catalog of the records, you're going to need to manage those records, and that's going to be everything from just keeping it updated, data quality is, is important, tracking things, tracking locations, or in the case of natural history museums, the specific, like a barcoded uh, container. Um, we still need to generate labels in both uh, kinds of institutions, uh, and there's always data quality issues that are um, easily dealt with or best dealt with with data normalizations. I would, I, I'm not going to say dwell a lot on that, but I will say that in those two aspects, though, uh, or rather in comparing those two, uh, those two institutions, um, the data normalizations, uh, um, that emphasis is really 
different. I find that um, in a lot of the archival and library uh, databases and domains I've um, uh, learned, uh, data normalization is um, uh, not very um, modernized, shall we say. Uh, so I, I would say that Arctos has uh, much higher data normalization procedures and, and uh, processes. Um, but a lot of the other functions that um, a uh, institution needs to uh, conduct its business with uh, are pretty much the same. There's going to be transactions, so loans, uh, though in the case of archives, they're more like requests in-house and external. Those could be also exhibit requests. Uh, you want to track usage, essentially. Um, there's metadata standards in both um, institutions to follow. And then, of course, we're still dealing with digital asset management in both uh, domains. So I had a previous functional requirements list from the um, early days of the MVZ when we started considering different kinds of databases and different and what we wanted out of a, a database. I mean, eventually, you know, you, you, you know that we ended up with Arctos. But um, I could take that document, essentially, and ask myself all the same functional requirement questions of the archives. And um, essentially, it boiled down to this uh, parallel list. So that made me feel pretty comfortable with the idea of moving forward uh, um, and considering more deeply Ar Arctos for the archival um, needs. There are some significant differences between the ar uh, archival workflows and a typical biological one. Um, so here's just a, a quick example, um, uh, or rather sort of a, a very generalized um, schematic for that. So you know, you have the uh, accessioning or acquisition phase, uh, whatever that may be, it could be estates, it could be um, collectors just dropping off a bucket of specimens and some notes. But you know, we still have a process for doing that, uh, for accepting that. Um, there's still organization, preservation questions, um, uh, you know, which would be akin to the same sort of things that you would do for prepping a, a specimen. Um, and a lot of other, you know, sort of the, the very uh, process-oriented um, protocols that are pretty well established. But that's where it really differs between um, the archival workflow and the um, natural history museum workflow. Because in the ar archives, um, there's yet another set of decisions you need to ask yourself. Um, and that's sort of uh, determining what's the collection, how, are, how is the collection, uh, the items within the collection organized. There could be also um, levels between the collection level and the item level. So an item could be actual individual um, field note books. It could be individual field notebook sections, or it could be individual field notebook pages, to give uh, you know a, sort of a simple example. Um, and so those generally um, are not always cataloged at the, at the most granular level. Uh, there's a saying in, in the archives world about more process and less, uh, or more progress, less process. And so what they're really talking about is trying to organize those itemized levels at sort of higher uh, 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 um, groups, groupings that, that make some sort of sense. And those sort of higher levels then um, are gathered into a, a specific collection, and, and usually, they're, um, the collection at the collection level, they, um, that organization may be already sort of um, established, uh, established in the way that they were either handed over to the archives. Um, so usually, you you're, you don't want to like um, impose your um, uh, uh, organization on, let's say, personal papers. If um, a professor hands me over a series of correspondence, but they're organized by project, not by the recipient, then that's the way we're going to keep them. And if uh, and vice versa, we're not going to switch that around. But at both levels, you want to have some access. And that's going to vary whether we're talking about the collection level or we're going to talk about the itemized level. Um, 
we there are established library uh, databases uh, like Online Archive of California, um, and then there's you know established portals that we've created for more of the itemized level, and that would be sort of like the eco reader where you can actually look at a, individual pages or maybe the Arctos catalog eventually, and that's kind of where I'm going to get to. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about all of that when I show the demo, just so you can sort of see that in action. Yeah, the other aspect that um, that uh, archives has to deal with is uh, this issue of preservation. And so this has been like a huge challenge. This is just some examples of how we've tried to deal with this. Uh, we've got you know lots of rehousing to do because we we get a lot of. Um, acid acidic papers the original paper is full of acid um, and you can see some examples here of one when you have an acidic paper on another acidic paper how that can leave shadows uh, we just have a lot of other issues here um, and then this all of these preservation issues also are important when we're dealing with digital media because um, the lifespan of digital media uh, is not clear. We know that from some of our floppy disks that they're not very uh, long, actually. And um, so we've had a lot of, um, uh, I wouldn't say practice, but we have a little bit of experience extracting data from uh, floppy three and a half inch drives. And, and usually we only have one <laughs> shot before the uh, media itself is rendered useless and we can't extract any more pixels from it. So here's just a quick example when I'm talking about process. So for us, the you know, sort of prepping a specimen, the process is also about preservation. So you can see the unprocessed version of um, a set of um, uh, records that were that was handed over in an acidic uh, cardboard box wrapped in more acidic paper. Um, and everything was already written on probably uh, acidic paper to begin with. Uh, we've got pest issues. We've got just dirt issues. Um, we have ways of dealing with this. They all take time, of course. And um, when they're in boxes like that, they're also just completely useless for researchers. And so the other example is when we get our hands on it, it's gone through quarantine. It's been organized, rehoused. Um, and now it's uh, it's a lot more pleasurable to find things, but you can actually find things. Um, but the most important thing is how are we going to find things in a database and catalog? So um, I'm about to get into um, uh, Arctos itself, but um, before I'll just say that um, our first task was to uh, examine the Archivist Toolkit database. Um, I don't know if anybody has any experience in um, archival databases. Um, you can shout out yes or no. I, I can't see the screen, so I'm not sure who's. If you if you haven't, they are very different beasts from a um, um, from any biological specimen database I've worked with. So that was a real learning curve for me. Um, I, I found that there were some things that there, there was a lot of tables and, and details for, um, especially at the sort of collection level. But then when you get to the itemized level of things, I, and, uh, th there seems to be a dearth of fields and controlled vocabulary and all sorts of other things that I, I, that I, rec I would have recognized from a, um, a collection management uh, uh, platform that I'm used to. So it was a real sort of change. Um, there was also lots of um, room in the Archivist Toolkit for differing workflows. Uh, Archivist Toolkit is a open source or was an open source um, um, database that was uh, I think only second in use among archives across the world. So they probably had to be pretty flexible for all the different kinds of libraries that would want to use it. Um, but uh, like I said, I, I found the um, lack of logical process really confusing at first. Uh, I did get to figure it out because what we did was take a look at all the tables and archivist toolkit, all the fields, and try to map it across um, 
what I knew to be, um, well, first of all, sort of like just the core, Darwin core-ish kind of fields in Arctos, but then across all the tables and other things that are very Arctos specific. Um, and so we, so, and, and I would say, you know, we somewhat w uh, had a pretty good mapping for all everything in, in Archivist Toolkit. Uh, frankly, there was a lot of things in Archivist Toolkit that we just ended up dropping, but then we weren't really using them either. So those were easy kind of calls, but that took quite some time. And then we had to sit down and have a lot of discussions. Carla Cicero and I and uh, Erica Brock uh, had a lot of discussions uh, because we had to have decisions. And frankly, they were some of these decisions were kind of um, um, arbitrary. Oh, not arbitrary, but you know, kind of were uh, um, uh, specific to the. MVZ archives, like there was no right answer, right? So things like taxonomy authorities, uh, there was a few to choose from because Arctos has already imported them into our taxonomy. So obviously it, it, um, we looked at those first. Uh, I think we pretty much liked um, a little bit of everything, to be honest, but we ended up uh, going with nomenclature 4.0 because it seemed to have most of the use cases we knew we were gonna have to deal with, which was uh, essentially the field notes. That was like our main priority, but it also was able to accommodate some of the stranger things we have like bear traps and old photography equipment and, um, and um, uh, correspondence and, and uh, a lot of different kinds of images and media, uh, uh, digital media. So those were really uh, also important. Uh, we had to make decisions about how we were going to number things uh, and how we were going to organize our accessions moving forward. So there are a lot, some of this stuff was just like, you know, it was just imagine yourself starting a brand new collection because that's what we were doing, uh, both physically but also uh, in the database. So we had a lot of um, discussions around that. And then the next, uh, the and then finally we were getting ready to to get stuff into Arctos. So the main first thing I did it was probably the first thing I think uh, uh, Teresa does too when she starts a new collection is load those agents because that's kind of like your your easy to do. And I I did a ton of like agent searches even before we started this early on because I was just kind of curious like how many of our agents matched people in the database and it was pretty high. So about three quarters were already. Um, in Arctos. So that was a, a super big win. And, uh, but what the archivist, archivist toolkit had was a little bit more biographic details that Arctos did not have. Um, so we were able to fill in a bunch of stuff for Arctos and we're still kind of uh, doing that uh, um, as, as we move, uh, you know, uh, as we continue to process things. So that was good. So we were able to load in like, you know, uh, just like 20%, 25%. I don't remember the exact number of agents, but it wasn't a huge amount. Um, uh, these were just the ones that uh, uh, weren't already in Arctos. So these were really like the historic figures or other folks that, you know, hadn't collected basically a specimen. Then um, the then we had to start processing some of the things out of Archivist Toolkit for bulk loading into to Arctos. Uh, that required a lot of extra scripting and programming work. Uh, Erica Brock was instrumental in that, um, and she was able to um, bulk load uh, over uh, 300, close to 400 accessions into Arctos, and that was our next big step. Um, we also created um, new containers and barcodes throughout the museum. So uh, we went around. Uh, physically did a survey, you know, which rooms do we have um, uh, archives, uh, collections, uh, pretty much the answer was everywhere we have art. Uh, <laughs> it, it really doesn't stop uh, at any room, but the bulk of our stuff is actually in a single room, uh, which we had a, a um, IMLS grant to um, to upgrade with um, uh, uh, stack containers on rollers so we were able to um, uh, assign a, a location essentially for each um, aisle and then each column and shelf within those uh, aisles so we kind of have this um, uh, hierarchical structure so the Arctos's containers really worked really well for that so anyways we were able to create pre-create all of those um, places in in Arctos and now we had a place to put all of our accessions there. 
So, um, and then along the way, we also started this um, archives manual. Um, so I'll show a little bit of that too. Um, it, it's our process. It's really to help me remember things, to be honest. Um, and then now for training as we're bringing students on board to help us process. So I'm just going to, um, this presentation kind of ends on just some challenges to think about. Um, so there are a few things that I have not been able to figure out uh, because they don't exist in Arctos right now. And this is where um, I, I'm happy to have further conversations. Um, uh, there's a lot to be um, uh, um, uh, imagined in Arctos uh, in terms of improving it just visually for um, cultural and archival collections. But these are more sort of core functionality that um, currently don't exist. And one of those is finding aids. So if you're unfamiliar with finding aids, finding aids is basically a um, narrative to help you to help researchers understand what you have in a particular archival collection, because it, the collection could be uh, you know, uh, can be very uh, widely different. It also can bring together more than one accession. Um, so you could have a finding aid around um, the Joseph Grinnell papers, for instance. That's an example here on the Online Archive of California. And so in our previous database, we actually had um, um, archive students, interns, um, write, research and write these finding aids, put it into the database, we were able to export them out and then share them with the Online Archive of California. While the format they require is EAD, we don't have that functionality in Arctos. Doesn't mean that we can't create it, just means we don't have it right now. But where do I put these narratives? Do I put them into an Arctos project? That seems to be the way we're, we're thinking right now. Um, do we need something else? Uh, we can't. Um, finding aids aren't always biographical, so that's why I, I hesitate to put it into an agent's page profile, for instance. So there's a lot of, you know, discussion that could happen around that. The other challenge is if we want to continue to share um, also our listings with other um, online catalogs for libraries, um, like WorldCat or other ones, we were actually in the middle of dis, uh, negotiating uh, to have our, our archives listed in WorldCat, for instance. Well, those are going to require other kinds of um, export formats, uh, MARC and MODS specifically. In fact, we're using MODS to supply um, the archives uh, information to the eco reader which is something that we actually created, so we have a little bit more control over that one. Um, but those are the sort of things that either we rewrite completely or we um, figure out a way for Arctos to um, accommodate those export formats. I don't think that it, they'll be hard. These are basically all XML based um, formats, but um, but we haven't figured out. It, is that the best way? Does does archive space have a role here? You know, there's a lot of questions here. Uh, so to be continued, we'll have another one of these eventually. Uh, so let me just get into, oops, sorry, why aren't you, there we go, I'm just trying to um, get into uh, Arctos here, oops. So here's a, just a quick peek at our ma manual that we're in process, so we've got kind of this uh, uh, place where we can um, record how we handle our accessions. Um, you can see this is our new collection code. We have uh, an accession numbering schema that starts with the year and then just sequentially um, uh, counts down the year. Uh, we've got um, uh, the same sort of nature of material. This was the, the, these were easy mappings, by the way, from Archivist Toolkit into Arctos. And, um, and right now we, we're having all of our accessions be private. We're, we've uh, we're reconsidering that. We're thinking that maybe this uh, accessions, we put a lot of information there. Some of, most of it can be public, I think. Um, so we're, we're thinking about that. Um, our cataloging schema is a little bit different from just a, a, a sequential numbering system. We actually append them with the accession number, and then we have uh, a, a sequence of numbers after that. That allows us to continue to um, catalog uh, field notes um, and sections when we have time. The most important thing uh, for us is to get them accessioned and in 
Arctos as a database because then at least I can um, note where these things are being kept. And uh, I may not want to accession uh, or rather catalog every record, but um, uh, or I don't have time to, but I need to be able to find at least the accession. Yeah, is there a question? I see a hand up now. Hey, Michelle, it's Angie. Yeah. Hey, I have a question. Um, I'm glad to see you're following <laughs> the, the, the trinomial numbering system for your catalog numbers. I'm wondering why you've decided to not use leading zeros on the last part of your catalog number. Oh, yeah. Well, there was some, uh, um, we, so we do have it on the accession number. We don't have it on the um, catalog number because it was kind of interfering with some of our um, sorting. And we found that it was just easier to, to deal with in um, our spreadsheets, frankly. I mean, I don't, is there, do you have a specific reason to use them? For well, instance? all of the systems that we've used before wouldn't sort properly. It would go 1, 10, 11, 12. Oh, right, yeah. And then when it got to two, 20, it would go 2. So even now, Arctos won't properly sort. Um, prior to 2000, we had a we have this UA before our numbers. And then the, the last two years, so mm -hmm. UA 64, it started in 63. But so yes. up 63 yes. to 99, it's it's two digits. And so those all sort, and then we in 2000, we started the four numbers for the year, but the 2000s don't sort properly in the catalog records with yeah. everything else. So we have this problem, um, and I know the oh, fine yeah. art collection renumbered all of their early accessions um, to accommodate that, but likewise, then the leading zeros on the catalog numbers um, our previous database 4D would not sort the catalog numbers properly. Same thing with the location codes. Um, we'd have to put shelf zero one rather than shelf one because they right. would make it an alphanumeric. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me ask you how many leading zeros can, because I, I, I guess part of it also was I remember thinking, I can't really anticipate how many catalog numbers I'm going to have, right? Do I put three? Do I want to, yeah. you know, or will is, is, two enough i you know that that was the other part of my thinking there yeah so for the archaeological and the ethnographic and historical at uam we use three for the accession and then four for the catalog number um the fine art collection because we archaeologically they will get sometimes you know into the thousands within one accession as they're yeah. you know cataloging individual sites um ethnographically we probably would have been fine just with three the fine art collection dropped down to to two leading zeros and then the number you know three places essentially um but we we have four because we do occasionally have some of these split collections with archaeology where our numbers are inserted in with these yeah. historic accessions. And so they'll have 2051 and we'll have 2053 and then that's it. Um, yeah, so we, we do need all four of those places in the catalog number. Yeah, well, see, that was the thing is in the future, I'm also just anticipating some some poor slob in the future may have to catalog down to individual page numbers on a field note, for instance, because it's been cited or used in artwork or whatever. And so, yeah, it could be in the thousands then. And that's why I didn't want to, but then for, for at least my tenure, it's, I, I will, I, I don't think I'll be able to get into the thousands on a particular accession. So that's why I, you know, we decided to, to just pass on that, but yeah, we'll see how it goes. You know, I, I have been thinking about that sorting issue and um, I actually have found a little bit of um, some, tips on maybe how we might be able to accommodate that uh, just just in the interface. So I, that's something I want to talk to Dusty about. But um, yeah, thanks for asking. I, I again, this is what I'm saying. All these little decisions had to be made. And you know, we had a lot of back and forth about them. Um, and sometimes it would just be over emails. And then sometimes we'd be like, Okay, now we just need to sit down and just discuss and make a decision like today's the day. So those there was a lot of that sort of thing. Um, one thing that we didn't have to make Michelle, a decision about, but sorry, Michelle, we, I'm going to interrupt you. We have one question in the chat as well. Um, oh, go ahead, please. It's relevant here. So it says, I've heard conversations of best practice and database design where encoding meanings into accession catalog numbers 
might not be the best practice because of reasons like this. Are there thoughts on leaving behind this practice and going with strictly numeric catalog numbers? Uh, yeah, we considered that um, heavily, but um, this is, but the fact of the matter is for the most part, we're, we won't have the time of many times to actually completely catalog a collection. So this goes back to that split when I was talking about the collection level stuff, um, like let's just take the Gr Joseph Grinnell papers, for instance. Um, we have a lot of information and we have locations now for those things. Um, but, you know, I may only have the time to create a record for uh, the bound field notes for Gr Joseph Grinnell until I get a request for a bunch of his unbound field notes. And now that I've pulled all this stuff out of the archives, I'm probably not going to put them back in until I make a bunch of, um, re until I catalog a bunch of records. And this has been going on um, uh, for the next, for, you know, uh, recently too, where I had a request for something. And so, you know, um, so because of that, if I were to do it sequentially, this, the sequences are going to, the catalog numbers are going to be all over the landscape because I'm not doing, I'm not cataloging them by accession, like I would with a, uh, a, a, a biological collection. Usually we completely catalog an accession and then move on to the next accession, right? So every, you know, I mean, that doesn't always happen. Of course, there's exceptions to things and people don't mind if an accession has a whole bunch of different catalog series and, and numbers jump around, but more or less, you don't wanna see too much craziness in that. And um, I feel like the accessions in, uh, or the records for archives would be exceptionally crazy. And this kind of just puts a lid on that a little bit and lets us sort through them. So actually, since we're taking this break here, I'll just give you an example here. So right now we only have um, 82 catalog records. I should say when we restarted this, the very first like two, three maybe, I used the data entry page and I entered data in um, individually. Since then, we've bulk loaded everything else in batches of like 10 to 20, 25, depends on like who's work, helping me work stuff out, sometimes 50 records. I think that was the biggest one so far. And it, and it works, it worked out great as a bulk loader because it's pretty simple. We're not, I don't have a lot of add-ons basically. But essentially, if you were to open one of these up, you can see that, um, you know, here's the first one. We for so we made a decision to catalog things um, not on the individual page record, but on the section because sections generally for us, um, you know, maybe a single trip or a species account or something that kind of is um, makes sense to the author. So generally like a, an expedition to Yosemite Valley, for instance, that'll be one section in a larger uh, bound volume. And I'm sorry, I didn't bring an example, but um, they, they correspond to actual sections, well-defined sections within the bound, bound volume. So this is uh, one section, this happens to be an unbound one. So this is all in one folder. Um, and uh, we do what we do have is sort of a uh, identifier, a volume identifier. In this case, I know there's only one, so this isn't really a great example here. But I think I have another example here. Here, actually, let's uh, go search on. Um, so you can see I, I've got a, a couple of different accessions here, and I can see uh, immediately that I've got um, a different section and a different. Um, set of uh, volumes here. So here's volume 4044. So, and, you know, Angie's point about their sorting is, is clear here. Um, so here's section two of this specific volume. And if um, I want to see all the sections for a given volume, I can search for just that volume. So that, uh, so we use those volume identifiers. And so here's just the volume ones. And if you actually sort on identified as, because we've been using the taxonomy string to help identify our um, volumes. And, you know, we just um, decided that we were going to name everything with the volume and, the, and then the section number um, for the mm -hmm. field notes. Uh, so now I can see them in more or less uh, 
the order that they're bound in. So this is all in a single book, but um, it has five sections and we've made a record for each section. Part of the reason why we've done that also is because each section, uh, if there's a catalog uh, included in that volume, it'll be one of those sections. And then I'll be able to associate that section, this one record to all the specimens that are related to it. So I haven't gotten to that part. That's actually the goal eventually. That'll be our the next webinar in a year from now where we've actually integrated the MVZ ARCH or ARC uh, collections with the MVZ bird, mammal, herp um, catalog records. So that's that's phase, you know, three maybe. Anyways, <laughs> uh, but that's kind of, this is where we are right now. And, and uh, we're trying to live with the consequences of our decisions and deciding if whether or not we're we're happy with it. And so, um, yeah, inputs, inputs welcome. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so going back to the taxonomy, this is uh, how we, we built out our taxonomy. It, it does mean that we need to find some kind of um, uh, nomenclature uh, that matches whatever we're dealing with. Um, so far, it's been easy because there's one called notebook. So that's easy, but uh, we do have a lot of other ones that uh, will get trickier. Um, like court, I think there's one for correspondence. Those are easy, but you know, what do I do with bird band logs, or what do I do with um, you know observation census tables? Um, so uh, some of those we we may just have to make decisions like th those will go as um, as uh, as log books or catalogs. I think there's we have those options. Um, and th that's the sort of decisions and, and um, use cases that we're finding, and then we kind of record it in our manual so we can pass that on and, and people can be more or less consistent moving forward. Um, let's see, uh, I think that's pretty much all I've got here for now. I can um, show you uh, a little bit, so this is, um, this is the what the public would see on the field notebook page, but just to make life a little bit easier for our um, staff, they can log in, and actually you guys can do this too. Uh, well, actually you can't, sorry, you can't see our uh, collection, but if you're an MVZ uh, curator and you need to find something, then you can at least open this up and see all the accessions that are associated with this particular project. So we may be creating um, sort of MVZ archives projects, uh, one for correspondence, and then everything that kind of has, a, every accession that has some kind of correspondence associated with it um, can be at least listed here. And that makes it a little bit easier for um, staff to find things. Um, and so you can kind of see that we also have locations here, it's just as, you know, text, <clears throat> it's not findable uh, right now. Um, we also uh, include um, the previous databases uh, resource um, uh, record numbers um, and uh, um, yeah and the 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 tricky part though is that you know our accessions could have more than one location so for instance this this uh, set of field notes you can see you have to actually go into at least two rooms to go find everything. So we, we also will be kind of consolidating a bunch of things as well. Looks like we have a question from Angie. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to keep bugging you here. Yeah, keep bugging. <laughs> just jump right in. Sorry. Can I, I, you give us an example of, or and I hope I didn't miss this when I was being distracted by somebody else, um, the, uh, the media that you are integrating some of these records, either at the accession or at the catalog record level? Have you done PDFs of, of records or photos yeah. of bound volumes or anything to help visually identify these things. Yeah. And, or the the collecting or the your um your finding aid as a PDF that's associated with the um the, the accession record. Yeah. So okay. So those are all great questions and they're all uh I should have made 10 slides on all the works in progress, <laughs> the more decisions that are needed. So here's here's what I'm exploring right now. Um, and I, I am really interested to hear about other people's uh, ideas about that. So I have 
all of those things as PDFs and some kind of media. So I've got um, finding aids as PDFs and actually HTML. I don't know why I have them as HTML, but that's a different issue. Um, I also have um, things like deed of gifts. So those are easy to attach to accessions. That's where they belong, right? So that's so we've just we just upload it. We just use the the accession interface. Super easy. Just go gets gets right in there, and everybody get, has access to it that needs to see it. Um, so that's been great. We actually have a huge amount to catch up, but that's you know what students are for. They, that's a that's a fun easy job to do. The trickier thing is how am I going to best um, associate the uh, scans I have for field notebooks because I have scans for field notebooks mostly at the volume level they haven't been I could separate them out by section but you know who has time to do that um, I, I don't right now so if they've given to me as PDFs that's great I'd like to keep them together as a one single volume one place I could do that is actually at a publication level so I've been kind of thinking about this, and this is where this is where I've been starting to explore this option. Um, so I have a publication here. Actually, we've got a ton of publications under um, field notes. So if you were to search under publications in Arctos, almost all the publications that start with field notes are MVZ ones. Um, I could associate them with our field. Uh, notebooks. Um, I can do that in a batch, which I, I will do that one day uh, if, if this is the way we want to go forward. Um, what I'm thinking is uh, here at the publication level, if I already have an entry that's called, you know, what I don't have here, and this is what I, I need to fix up is like the volume number, make it a little more explicit that this belongs to this set of records. Um, I could attach some media here. This could be the, so it makes sense to have your volume PDF attached to the publication record of that volume. And then it's just a matter of uh, when I go back to, let's see, sorry, I don't even, now I'm like confused where I am. If I go back to our field notebook page, um, I, I should be able to see all the publications, click on any one of them, and then get a PDF for them. And then if I were to go to the cited specimen here, you know, uh, you, it would be clear that there's a publication associated. Where's my publication list? Uh, it's not here. It's up at the top. Where is it on the citations? Top? Oh, there it is. Yeah. So then I'd be able to, um, uh, you know, see that I could I could get go I could go to the actual publication citation and then find this a PDF. This is where I was saying that. Um, the intersection, or rather the, the um, interface for um, archival records and, and uh, probably a lot of cultural things too, could be really fine-tuned, I think, um, for, for Arctos. So things are a little bit, you know, easier to find. Um, anyway, so that's kind of where I'm thinking uh, right now. Um, and, I, and I've just been playing around with a, a few of these things. Um, and then once I think uh, we feel a little more comfortable, we'll bulk load a bunch, see how that looks, and then we'll kind of build from there. That, that's my thinking on at least the publication side. Media. Media is a whole other different thing. Um, so one of the things that we have in, uh, in, in the MVZ archives is uh, about uh, 16,000 historic images that have been scanned and digitized at high resolution uh, by an NSF grant uh, in the early 2000s. And uh, we have them all uploaded to Arctos um, as media, as just plain old media. Now, back in the day, this is before I, I uh, started working here, uh, media was also assigned um, an image number, and we still keep track of that. So. I have started a new collection in Arctos called MVZ Image, where I'm going to resurrect those image numbers. And um, I, I am thinking that the way to do that is, uh, and this is going to be an operation that I'll get some help from Lam or Dusty, but I, because all the information is already in Arctos as media, I can push a lot of that to our MVZ Image numbers. and. Um, then it will be a record because those images 
were not born digital. They actually represent um, copies in the uh, something, uh, some physical media in the in the archives, either a glass slide, a lantern slide, a 35 millimeter slide, a print, um, some in some cases sketches, you know, th those sort of things. Do they, should they be in, in MVZ image? They already have an image number. Maybe I want to continue to use MVZ arch. I haven't, I, we, you know, these are some decisions we still have to make. Um, and we're, we're kind of discussing um, the ramifications of these different, different um, um, decisions. So uh, that would be webinar number five. Yeah, uh, Michelle, I would love to talk with you a little bit more about that too, because I have sitting right behind me, I have four boxes of slides and print photos, and some of them are collection photos. Yes, they represent, you know, they're documentation of, of objects, but they're also about events and their projects that, you know, that are just like this, but they're con those projects are connected to the collecting events of those objects that are then represented. So, and yeah. those also have, they 35 millimeter slides have numbers written on them. Yep. And so they, you know, I, I think this is something that that I would love to see our collection having a UAM EH image or something, you know, connected to that also, because it's it it's connected to the people, you know, there's agents that are gonna tie together, there's physical objects, there's localities that that can all tie together and, and they're an important physical item that we are responsible for caring for. Yep. Um, that aren't necessarily better transferred to our library archives because they're they yeah. just float away and, and not ever be used. They are directly relevant to our collection. So uh, yeah. I'd be really interested in in having you know some being involved with with your discussions about that to see yeah. how you well, track on that. We we should definitely have a, a discussion about that. So here's an example of why we don't want them buried in the Bancroft Library, which is just up the hill from us, because then we we won't have access to them for research purposes. So here's an image, for instance, um, from uh, uh, the historic archives. It has an image number. It's Lassen Peak. And this is our resurvey effort from 2006. And you know they re the 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 guys who did this uh, retake, they you know reproduced the the scene with the with the vehicle. This is the MVZ vehicle in 1930, by the way, and this is our vehicle in 2006. And so this was clearly important for the resurvey effort. Um, by the way, you can see the same trees here, the same bushes are in the you know. So it's really interesting that some things just really hasn't changed very much, but. So there's this research angle, and we want to keep track of it. We I also have um, um, a whole bunch of loans to enter into Arctos regarding this historic image because it's been reproduced in several magazines, several articles. It's been used for research, you know. So there's all sorts of other things that that we need to to keep track of, and Arctos can do all of that. It, um, but it's how we want to treat it. So some of those things I can't. If it's if it's immediate, um, if it's media in Arctos, I can't do any of those things. I can't. You know, I, it's hard for me to keep track of location, preservation, all of those other things, and and also all the derivatives. Um, so that's why I originally I was thinking of this MVZ image collection. Um, which could still work. Um, it would just have to work in conjunction, I think, with our MVZ um, art collection, and, which doesn't mean to say it couldn't do that. Um, we, you can still have an accession that has more than one um, collection in it, right? So it could be that all of our accessions are still in MVZ art, but we're going to now reference a bunch of MVZ images if it's purely an image, you know, or maybe it's a mixture. It's a mixture of paper. So I've got some MVZ arch stuff in it. And I've got some MVZ image stuff because it's a mixture of, with images. So uh, yeah, these are all um, important, I think, things to think about. It's kind of fun to think about. Um, and uh, like I said, we, we haven't made any firm decisions yet because um, I I can be convinced either way. And I think at this point, it would be great to have some broader community discussions. So that way, um, 
we can, uh, um, you know, really plumb all the different aspects and angles, come up with some community guidelines. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. So we have about five minutes left. So if people want to ask questions or put them in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at this and you start to see there's so much intersection between publications, media, um, records, projects. And I think what it means is that Arctos is flexible, right? So you could go in a lot of different directions. Like for us, we've scanned all of our ledgers and we've connected yes. each ledger page to the relevant catalog records. Um, so we're kind of primarily using media as that functionality, but could just as easily start, sort of go down this way as well. But I think, um, you know, it'd be great if you guys <clears throat> forge some guidelines and we kind of start well, having sort of community-based practices, um, or or it could just mean you you manage your materials consistently within your collection and that works just as well, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I was just gonna say, I think the, the decision to actually have um, archives as like a standalone collection, you know, really depends on your, what your local, what your, how your local museum can like support that in terms of like staff and attention and, and time. I mean, it does take a lot of time. If, if, if you just want to, you know, make sure it doesn't get lost uh, in terms of the biological specimen collection, then you know what you're how you're handling it and this is the way harvard's been doing it too because I, I did poke around there i mean we did a lot of investigation of other museums and archives and tried to find what other people were doing um you know as handling it as media is is really great it's drop dead simple really uh so that would be like i think the the low you know effort um you, you know i think probably current staffs of a biological collection could handle that. But if you also are accepting a lot of uh, other kinds of material, a diversity of material, you have um, some of the bandwidth uh, or, you know, somebody dedicated to helping out with that, then um, it might be worth investigating, you know, archives as an actual, um, you know, uh, standalone collection. Um, we have a few. Um, yeah, what were, oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't look at the chats. Okay. Yeah. Items in the chat. Um, Angie mentions using entities for connecting across collections, which is absolutely, I think, a, a, an option. Um, and we can maybe talk about that in our next webinar. Um, Anna uh, doesn't have a question per se, but sounds like they're exploring at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden, um, looking for a CMS uh, or dams that um, can connect their living collections with specimens and archival collections, which, um, Anna, if you wanna reach out, we'd be happy to set up a meeting because um, that's something that Arctos can do really well in terms of connecting yeah. different records. Um, and then Tom is asking about um, any experience of getting funding at your institution, library or state funds. Yeah, Michelle, if you want yeah, to- Yeah, so- uh, we, we, uh, yeah, I think Emily mentioned that we did get a series of grants. We got grants from, uh, CLEAR, um, the Council on Library and something research, <laughs> uh, resources, sorry. And, um, we also got funding from IMLS. Uh, we also were, um, partners on a larger IMLS for scanning and digitization. The digitization grants were actually, um, sort of, a um, uh, um, uh, solicitations and they were kind of one-offs so they were not like the normal call for um, for grants but clear actually had a program called hidden collections and that actually was really instrumental in getting our archives uh, um, originally um, uh, put into a database so, and sort of organize and professionalize so that was really uh, great the hidden collections grant um, so, you know, um, I can send around some, um, some of these websites, but, you know, you, I basically just signed up for a bunch of different uh, listers. And so whenever there's a, sort of an announcement, Clear also had a round uh, during COVID, I think. Um, and I think uh, uh, Vicki got one of those. Uh, um, so hopefully she'll be able to talk about um, what they've been doing at UTEP at a um, Arctos working group meeting. Um, so, 
yeah, there's a, there are a bunch of uh, those kinds of grants. And, and then now that we have a lot of this stuff um, organized and uh, shared, um, uh, especially on the Online Archive of California, I've actually started talking to some folks at the state level to see if we can find some state funding for some of that. That's why I, actually, I am quite hopeful um, for some kind of um, uh, archive uh, specific um, expansion for Arctis because I think we could get grant uh, grant funds for that um, and then I would really also explore some um, of the triple IF uh, um, standards for our media and um, really sort of enhance that connection to media media that's recorded but media that's also like you know um, enhancing publications or other uh, other aspects um, so yeah, like I said, I'm kind of hopeful. We have written other grants that did not get funded um, for that, but that was also before we really uh, um, uh, wanted to put everything into Arctos. Um, those previous grants actually referenced our older archivist toolkit database, so I think this has a higher chance of getting something together. Uh, yeah, a leadership grant, let's do it. I, I, I submitted one. Um, that uh, the last leadership grant actually um, embedded a lot of the field notes um, transcriptions. So we had uh, a transcription proposal, and all the transcription, the raw data would uh, was supposed to go to Arctos, so we could uh, reference like specific catalog numbers and um, and then create observations from observations in the field notebooks. So we did have some of that. And I, so I think parts of that could be resurrected for an archive specific um, Arctis. And Michelle, are you um, comfortable sharing those MVZ, um, the manual yet? Uh, yeah, I, I, I can paste that into the chat. <laughs> yeah, it's a work in progress, though. Let me see um, if I can find the link. One thing I'll say in terms of funding, too, for those of you that are at a university, um, you should definitely connect with your library because oh, um, yeah. a lot of them have like a digital branch and might have um, opportunities to just put in a proposal for um, scanning. So for, we got all of our ledgers scanned um, and we had a 40 years worth of field notebooks scanned. <laughs> Um, and we didn't have to pay anything and, and they just did it over a few years and they have a, you know, they have a metadata um, staff member who actually was, I was able to kind of give her the Arctos schema and so she was able to output um, all of those links, which were all ARCs, um, so we could easily connect between the two databases and we still hold all the materials, so it, it was a really great uh, collaboration, so definitely yeah. excited. <laughs> That yeah. was my question about the metadata, because that's where we've been hit with trying to do these kinds of museum proposals, but or their archive proposals, and they want library metadata, and they want you to explain how you're going to create the metadata you know, for each of these yep. archival digital records, but essentially trying to explain to them that Arctos already creates that metadata just by the, the by the 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 um creating those relationships it it develops that metadata inherently and so that's been our kind of one of our hang-ups we've gotten dinged yeah. on our proposals on describing that metadata in terms of arctos versus the archive world and the library world yeah so i think that's where some of the gory details of the mapping that we've done might be helpful because what what um i think I think what Arctos could easily do, but we would ha it would it would definitely take a little bit of time and um, and uh, and attention. You know, we'd be able to uh, we would have to uh, create a few new fields for sure. They're they're not all inherently there, um, but it wouldn't be I don't think difficult. Um, what we really need though are those mods and mark uh, export formats. Um, the EAD, I, I, I'm not like 100% uh, per, uh, percent convinced uh, that's the way to go, but maybe even that, only because that, those EADs are a little more complicated. There's a lot of narrative and text and a lot of free formy type of stuff that Arctos, frankly, doesn't like to deal with. Or, um, but all the other stuff is like really, you know, um, 
it's just a matter of just having the right wrappers around the right terms and it, it just wouldn't be hard to do. It would look a lot like stuff that we've already, um, we already export or, or uh, talk with. And so I think, we, you know, uh, the missing piece then, Angie, would really just be like, oh, Arctos already speaks mods. You know, I mean, I think that's the, the part. And so I can see how we could have like a little archive module for Arctos and people can then, you know, have it as part of the profile for your particular collection. And then there, there you go. Um, yeah. And Anna just pointed out the Dublin core and Darwin core, you know, they're really similar. And, oh, yeah. And a really I, well established one in the library world. So yeah, I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. You know that D Darwin core clearly came from Dublin core. So there's already that connective uh, tissue. It actually goes back further than that. Uh, so I, so I started this uh, presentation because I have to give a presentation this afternoon to um, to a uh, to a undergraduate class. And one of the things, and there's a reference to the Library of Alexandria. So uh, so I I didn't really get into this because it's it's you guys. <laughs> but um, one of the things I just learned last night was um, the word museum actually come. Do you do you know this? Yeah, it comes from the greek word museon that's right the <laughs> yes. house of muses yes which was essentially the original name for that library of alexandria so yes. i was it's so, part of my dissertation <laughs> oh my god we're just here to back you up here so dr lynn <laughs> so anyways um next uh, webinar <laughs> yeah that'll be the next webinar but it yeah so there's a lot of i was gonna say uh genetic uh, DNA, ancient DNA between library and museums, so. Well, um, great. Um, thank you so much where it looks like we're at time and thank you for okay, sticking great. with us. Um, but thank you so much, Michelle. This is something, a topic that so many of us are interested in. And um, Yeah, well, thanks for uh, putting up with a very, very uh, loose demonstration <laughs> and very much a work in progress. But yeah, I'm, I please get in contact and uh, let's keep the conversation up. Sounds good. We'll, we'll see you all, all right. next time. Bye. Hey, bye. Good seeing you guys.